Take your Bible and turn to 1 John. 1 John we're going to be going through the book of 1 John. In order to have a full appreciation of John's statement, sometimes seem disconnected to us, or maybe not, like why do you say that? Um, oftentimes when you read the book of Proverbs, I think a lot of the Proverbs were actually verdicts passed on cases that Solomon had to deal with. And they were a word of wisdom on this particular case. They were copied down as wise sayings. But sometimes it's like, yeah, so? I mean, it's like that wasn't, that wasn't an incredibly uh, bright statement in and of itself. But if you look at it, if you knew the context in which it was said, uh, it would be more appreciated. And in order to have a full appreciation of John's statements and the usage of words, it is important to understand the errors that existed in his day and his means of refuting them. The Apostle Paul's statements and usage of terms must be also understood in the light of who he was correcting or refuting. Uh -huh. And that's why most uh, theologians today, many theologians today, mess up big time in the book of Galatians. Because they're not understanding what's being refuted and what the real problem was. And so, uh, I, I it always just really grieves me when I hear uh, modern preachers talk about what they think Galatians is dealing with. Because most of the time they're missing it. And therefore, you don't understand what's being said because you don't understand why it's being said. Paul was combating Judaizing Jews, where John was combating Gnostic Gentiles. Uh, Irenaeus says that Serinthus, who was a Gnostic, uh, a form of Gnosticism, appeared about the year 88, was known to the Apostle John, and it was in refutation of his errors that John wrote his Gospel. If that be true, then the Gospel of John was written uh, around the the later 80s, okay, or 88, somewhere in there. Some have said 86, I suppose it all depends on uh, other evidences that they come to. But, from internal evidence, it is quite likely that 1 John was written after the Gospel of John, because it seems that the people receiving 1 John, Paul was already assuming they had read the Gospel. Uh, a lot of his terms are the same, he refers to things... Uh, in the book of 1 John with less detail than in the Gospel. Okay, so in the Gospel he laid it out in more detail. Here he just refers to it uh, with the assumption that you've already got the Gospel, it seems. And so, I believe, in my opinion, that most of John's writings, uh, all of them most likely were written uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem. I think the evidence points that direction uh, definitely. The Gnostic teachings were varied, but in all of them there was a demeaning of the apostles, a demeaning of Moses, a demeaning of God's law, and ultimately God himself. We see that today so often. I've, I've grown up in church, many different churches, I've listened to many different preachers from many different groups, I've read many different religious books, and the, the demeaning of the apostles, the demeaning of Moses, the demeaning of God's law and God himself is a primary aspect. It's a foundational root of much heresy and false doctrine. Uh, so I'm going to give you five points here um, that uh, the, these Gnostics in John's day made. Quote, that the apostles did not deliver the doctrine of Jesus as they had received it, but made additions to it, especially in the commandments which they termed legal, whereas they, the Gnostics, retained the genuine and uncorrupted mystery. So they claimed to have the true knowledge, where the word Gnostic comes from the word Gnosis. Number two, by rejecting the commandments which they termed legal as not given by Christ, but added by the apostles without Christ's authority. We got these same kind of yo-yos today, folks. I'm only going to listen to the red letters. Well, Jesus said, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to Paul, I'm going to listen to Jesus. I've heard people say that to me. It's like, okay, 
Who wrote the words of Jesus that you possess? Did Jesus write those words? Did Jesus pin the red letters for you? No, the apostles pinned those and gave them to you. Right. So you're trusting the apostles ultimately. And it's like uh, the shallowness of, of some people's religiosity is, is quite appalling. Um, by rejecting the commandments which they, which they termed legal as not given by Christ, but added by the apostles without Christ's authority... It's like, how do you know? Uh, they counteracted the whole doctrine of sanctification, which is what they really wanted to do anyways, mm -hmm. and taught that you could be holy on the inside but live unrighteous on the outside. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Your position spiritually was not affected by your performance because sin had to do with the body and didn't affect the soul. And so we hear today, not by works of, of the law, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Uh, you know, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And what they're really saying is, don't expect me to be sanctified. Mm -hmm. Number three, from this they regarded sins as diseases. According to their system, the violent and irregular passions of anger, hatred, etc. were tortures for the soul. They were diseases, but not punishable transgressions of the law. The Gnostics admitted that the Supreme Being was perfectly holy and pure light, but they denied that the Supreme Being was the God whom the Jews and Christians worshipped. For the Jews and the Christians worshipped the Creator of the world, and the Gnostics asserted that the Creator of the world was either a spirit of darkness, or if He was a spirit of light, He was not free from darkness. In other words, Moses' law is not free from darkness. Because it was given by that Creator God, you know. Number five, the Gnostics generally denied that Christ was God manifest in the flesh. So you've got the Gnostic docetism, and they held that Jesus was an incorporeal phantom in which the Christ presented itself to mankind and then left him before the crucifixion. In other words, Christ was not flesh and bone and blood. He was not a real man. All right, that's where they went with it. Uh, because, okay, because if the body and, and material things are all bad, then Christ couldn't have been material. Okay? And according to their conclusion is, since the body and all material things are evil, then you can't be expected to live righteous in a body. So it's justified, excused. And our immaterial soul is un, unaffected by it because Christ was immaterial as well. The Serinthians, from a man named Serinthus, said Christ was just a man who was inhabited by the divine nature when the Holy Ghost descended on him at baptism and left him before his death. So there was many different... Serinthus had a, a, a tossed salad with Judaism paganism, Christianity, basically whatever he came up with. And uh, he lived during the time of John. And so John had to deal with all these different people with their different shades of opinion and idea, trying to hijack the faith. Exactly what Paul said would happen after his departure. Um, after the destruction of Jerusalem. And one of the primary things the Gnostics used for this was disconnecting Jesus from the Old Testament Scriptures. Disconnecting Him from His Jewishness. Disconnecting the Apostles from the Jewish Foundation. Because they were dealing with the nature of God. And they didn't want what the Old Testament said. Because it didn't fit with their ideas of the nature of God. <clears throat> so, Gnosticism in all of its forms basically was opposed to the Old Testament as the Word of the Almighty. The Word of Jehovah. The Word of the Father of Jesus. Okay, they had a problem with that. All of them, in general, had a problem with that. And later Marcion uh, picked up on that in his Marcionism. So they manufactured a conflict between the God of creation and the Father of Jesus. They manufactured a conflict in the ethics of Jesus and the ethics of the God of the law through Moses. Now, as we go into 1 John, listen to what John says. Okay? I believe that 1 John... 1 John is not an epistle. It's basically a treatise. Okay? 
And it's not written to anybody. An epistle is a letter to somebody. The second and third John are obviously epistles. But first John is a statement of doctrine and it was probably sent out around the same time that his gospel was. Um, so, 1 John 1.1 1, 1. <coughs> That which was from the beginning. There's a pillar of Gnosticism knocked out. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have scrutinized, which we have gazed upon. We have looked closely. But we didn't just see Him. We were with Him. We looked upon Him. We watched Him. And our hands have handled of the Word of life. For the life, the life, the eternal life, that, that, the life that begets all life, the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He is dismantling Gnostic ideology and destroying it uh, by his eyewitness account. And that's why God probably allowed John to live. All the other apostles by this time were most likely dead. Uh, the apostle Paul had been dead for possibly 20 years. So, if, if you read 1 John 1, 1 through and 1 and 2, and then go back and read John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, as a, you know, the other one says, that which was from the beginning, we're, we're, we, want, we want you to know that there's one God. Okay, every Jew believed that. But when you get rid of the Old Testament, you can have two gods, three gods. Okay, You're, now, now you've got the gospel, the writing of the apostles in Gentile hands, and, and Jesus in Gentile hands, and they're going to do with him what they want to do with him uh, because they've disconnected him from the scriptures of the Old Testament. So John says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's making these clear distinctions, undeniable. The same was in the beginning with God. The same. The same. All things were made by Him. He is the Creator. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There's a backhand to the Gnostics who claimed to have the greater knowledge. He said, this light shined in the darkness, and they didn't comprehend it. They are the darkness. So, here we have, okay, if you stop and, and look about you in, in creation, where did this all come from? Where did you and I come from? It didn't just happen. There is incredible design. The DNA from a seed produces a like tree or plant or person. Uh, our God is an incredible artist. He is amazing in His inventions, in His creation. Uh, one thing that evolutionists cannot figure out and explain is the idea of male and female. How does evolution explain that? Obviously, there was design in that situation. Obviously, in order for the propagation of uh, every race and every plant that requires the male and female aspects and the inter, the inter uh, dependence in nature of the pollinators and the pollen and all that sort of thing, evolutionists, they, they don't have an answer for those things. They don't know why that there are plants that mimic in their coloration and beauty, they mimic a female wasp to get the male wasp to come and light on them and pollinate them by walking around and going on to the next one. They, they can't figure any of that out. Everything that is beautiful in life. You know, when I first met my wife, there was a smile that was very captivating. 
Who, who had the idea of a smile? Who came up with that? God did. There were the, the eyes. Her beautiful eyes. And now her red face. <laughs> uh, but who, who came up with all that? God. God thought it all up. Love, romance, uh, procreation. It's all God's idea. It didn't just happen with a big bang, folks. That life begets life. There was, there's one planet that we know of that is teeming with life. The blue planet. Our planet. Everyone else, all the other ones are just round globs of dirt and gases and different things. Dead orbs. But there's one planet that's full of life. I mean, from one end to the other, it's teeming with life. Well, we know that there was, in the beginning, the word of life. The life was manifested. That life, that eternal life, that ultimate life. What would it be like if that ultimate, eternal, almighty life became man? Who lived as a man? What would you expect? If he became a baby in a virgin's womb and grew up in a carpenter's shop, what would you expect from such a being? It was that life. Well, you know, if you get too close to any individual and look upon them too closely, they will disappoint you. It doesn't matter who it is. Okay? You, I, I remember when I was a young man, I saw preachers and heard about their churches. You know, uh, there was a big pastor in Chicago, and he had this great church and great school and all that was going on. And it sounded so amazing and so wonderful that I went there. I went to college there. I got involved in all the ministries, all the things that sounded so full of God and power and just success. Well, it was disappointing when I got up close and viewed the tactics and the gimmicks and, and some dishonesty and, and so forth. It was very disappointing to me that it wasn't what I thought it would have been. Okay? Because I got up close and viewed it closely. It was disappointing. Do you know what? You will not live with your new groom or your new bride very long until you realize I'm married to a sinner. I'm married to someone who has got Adam's and Eve's blood. And they're just a people and they have problems. And there, there's maybe some pimples and warts in their character and their thinking. And they're, they're not perfect. I thought they were. I thought she was perfect. Well, then I get married and I find out, you know what? She's not perfect. And you know what she finds out? I'm not perfect either. But, when the, the eternal life became flesh, John says, we heard him, we saw him, we looked closely upon him, our hands handled him. And in... Uh, John 1, 14, he says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The ones closest to Him are the ones who are writing these things. What did they see? They saw humanity and divinity in one. They saw a man where they said, What manner of man? Is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? He, a minute ago, he was sleeping in the boat. That speaks of weakness. That speaks of humanity. Now he stands up and rebukes the storm, and the winds and the sea become calm at his command. What do we have here? What is this? In Luke 9 24, Jesus said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man's advantage if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul and be cast away? For whosoever will, shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed 
when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's. They saw him as a man. People who were farther away from him, they'd only heard about him, heard all kinds of things that weren't necessarily true. With most people that you hear about that are famous, the closer you get to the facts, the more disappointing it is. With Jesus, the closer you came into the facts, the closer you got to him, the more you were awed and amazed. And the more people looked upon him, and the more they were with him, the more they were astounded. <coughs> but Titus and I were talking about this passage. Uh, when he shall come in his own glory, and his fathers, and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the kingdom of God. Or Matthew 16, 28 says, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And Titus asked me, what, what, do, you, what do you think is the fulfillment of that? We were talking about it. Well, I think it's very clear, especially from what Peter says, that it was a Mount of Transfiguration. It says after that, And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, now on the way up that mountain, he seemed just like a man. He was breathing heavy. He was walking up a mountain. He was climbing. When they got up there, they started praying. As they fell asleep, he kept praying. And it says, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Can you imagine? That, that's a very small verse, but it's very deep and wide. You've got Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus the life that was manifested in the flesh, about a necessary step that was going to take place in Jerusalem. Moses' salvation and Elijah's salvation and every Old Testament saint's salvation was hinging on that decease in Jerusalem. It was the biggest thing going. Jesus dying in Jerusalem as the Lamb of God was the biggest thing in the news headlines of heaven. And so they're talking with him about that. And Peter, James, and John uh, wake up and are listening and watching. And it came to pass, uh, it says that Peter and they were with him, were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, three tents. One for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud, and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close. And told no man in those days of any of those things which they had seen. Jesus told them that, to do that. But in 2 Peter 1.16, Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus in His uh, glory that He said right before this Mount of Transfiguration, in His own glory in His Father's. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty, for He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the Holy Mount. So what did they see? What did John see? They saw a man. But they also saw God. They saw that eternal life. They saw and handled things that they did not comprehend, could not comprehend. They saw His humanity and they saw His glory. The life that was here before any other life. The life that created the material universe. The life that was also the light. In John 1.14, And that Word, the Word that was with God, the Word was God, was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. We didn't get up close and get disappointed. We didn't get to know Him real good and realize there's flaws. We didn't get to know Him real good and realize He's not perfect. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
This is what Jesus said with a conversation with them the night uh, before he was betrayed in the garden. John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that, say, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now, they had been with him very closely, watching him for three and a half years, or three years at least, at this time. What chances would you have of convincing people that when they've seen you, they've seen the Father? Like, like no, I, I can remember too many stupid things I did and too many stupid things I said. I remember too many of them. I remember too many mistakes I've made. Who would ever be insane enough to make such a statement if you really know yourself and have a memory, right? But Jesus said that and they agreed. They understood it. It made perfect sense to them. And they gave their lives for it after watching this God-man be crucified and risen from the dead. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the very works sake. In other words, all the incredible miracles you've seen. If you have a hard time believing that I, a flesh and bone human being, is the Father in me and I in Him, then think about all the incredible works that have been done before your eyes. So John, in 1 John 1, in answer to all the fools that he had to deal with, said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. Now, understand, John's probably the only one on planet Earth at this time that could say that. I'd say most of the other ones have died off. Okay? But John is dealing with a new generation of people claiming things about the apostles that they couldn't claim while those apostles were alive. There are people today who claim things that they couldn't claim while the apostles were alive. They wait till they're dead and then they come up with their little... Satan knows what he's doing. Satan is multi-generational. Okay? And so uh, God allowed John to live long enough to deal with this new generation of Gentile uh, thinking in regards to Jesus. Disconnecting him from his Jewishness. John dealt with it. John, uh, John's Gospel and 1 John directly destroy Gnosticism. Okay? That's why when I was leaving the Baptist church and turning against the Gnostic tenets in the Baptist doctrine, a Baptist pastor said of me to my father-in-law, as long as he's stuck in 1 John, there's no hope for him. Well, I've been stuck in 1 John now, since then, for about 25 to 30 years. Because once saved, always saved is Gnosticism. Okay? The, the false grace, the uh, once saved, always saved, that is Gnosticism. So he says, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. We're drawing lines of communion here, drawing lines of fellowship. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. 
John's words are loaded. He is drawing lines here, and he is excluding the Gnostics. The Gnostics, he will say later on, went out from us. You know, I, I think Satan is more active in the churches than he is in outside opposition to the churches. Satan knows he's going to get more done by joining the churches than he is by fighting them outwardly. He's got people on both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's not, it's not surprising to me, and it's, it's very obvious to me, that in the communist efforts to take over America, they've got people on both sides. They've got people yakking away against them, but bowing to them continually. Okay? And they've got people, uh, total leftists over here, saying things that are ridiculous and stupid because left, the leftist ideology is, is a destroyer of nations. Why do you think we have thousands and thousands coming to America from Guatemala, Ecuador, uh, um, hey, Haiti, you know, Cuba, all these different places? Because they're so, they, they, they don't have any jobs. They've destroyed those economies. So they want to come up here. Well, the sad thing is most of those people don't know enough history to know what destroyed their economy. Um, but Satan works that way. He, he's got some, some rhinos and, and, and uh, people posing as right-wingers. And they're over here yapping away. So, so we who are seeing our nation destroyed by the leftists feel like, well, at least, at least there's somebody out there fighting that makes us feel a little better as the, the whole thing comes crashing down and they're destroying uh, our national heritage and our constitution. <coughs> Satan has the same thing going. He's got people on both sides. He's got people up there preaching in the pulpit, but they know where to draw the line, what not to say, and they also are slowly allowing the church to drift towards the world. They're slowing, uh, slowly allowing the church to delve into Gnosticism. And so, Paul said that would happen. Men of your own self shall arise. Uh, wh wh why, would, why would anyone waste their time developing a religion that they knew was homemade? Why wouldn't they just go live it up? Well, because the propagators of such things are full of the devil. They're motivated by the devil. And so they also, there's, there's little treats along the way for the, the devil likes to give them. I mean, after all, the, the power and prestige is, is kind of nice, right? But these Gnostics, uh, they would come up with all kinds of, of philosophy and, they, and so forth. Why? Why not just skip it if you know it's homemade? If, if I thought this Bible was something that I connived and came up with, why waste the time? Why not just go out and enjoy life in, in a carnal way? Well, the devil is working overtime, not just from without, but from within. The devil is trying to tweak doctrine. He's trying to he's trying to come in as an angel of light, which was said earlier, and sound pious, and yet undermine the faith once delivered to the saints. He's been doing that for 2,000 years, and I look around after studying my Bible for the last 38, 39 years, uh, I look around and the faith once delivered has been watered down, compromised, adjusted, tweaked, changed. Most churches do not even have the goal of the faith once delivered to the saints. Okay? They are fighting for pet doctrines and pet verses, and a lot of them are fighting for Christian liberty. So they can be a Christian, and they want to make sure that they have their liberty. They want, a, they, they want a, a promise of heaven so, you know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't say they're not a Christian. They're going to heaven as though, they, as, as though they're going to convince God. 
But I look around and I realize that Satan has been working hard and making great headway. Much of what we see as conservative Christianity is teaching a mixture of Gnosticism and Bible. The Mennonites are with their Marcionism. The Baptists are with their eternal security. The Calvinists surely are with their teachings of fate. Okay? Um, which is predestination. But they used to call it fate. Now they call it predestination. And how many churches did that take in? The false grace, uh, the false concepts of what works is, the idea that my position cannot be affected by my performance, uh, even, even the uh, false concepts of the tongues and things like that. So where is the faith once for all delivered to the saints? Well, that's what we want to know. <clears throat> he says, I write these things unto you that your joy may be full. Do you realize that every false concept you believe takes away from your eternal joy? It takes away from your fellowship with God. Um, <clears throat> The, all these things the devil comes up with is to, to discourage mankind from seeking God. The false definitions of love, the false concepts of purpose in life, the false concepts of our Creator, the false concepts of His law, the slander against His law, the redefining of love and grace, all that does is confuse and muddy the waters so you won't find God. Or you will not, you will not be uh, drawn to honor and worship and, and have a right idea of God because you have wrong concepts. Look at verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And which God is this? That which was from the beginning. That which created everything that was made. Nothing was made that He didn't make. And this is the God, in Him is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. He is light. He is love. He is life. So when you turn away from Him, you turn away from light and love and life. Now the devil has worked hard to confuse that and slander that. In Him is no darkness at all. In His law is no darkness at all. In His love is no darkness at all. In His commands, there is no darkness at all. Amen. I said earlier the Gnostics admitted that the Supreme Being was perfectly holy and pure light, but then they denied that that was the God whom the Jews and Christians worshipped. Because the Jews and Christians worship the Creator of the world. And they uh, asserted that the Creator was either a spirit of darkness, or if He was a spirit of light, He was not free from darkness. Now, Marcionism takes right up there. Okay, that the Creator God could not be the same as the Father of Jesus. Because the Father, Jesus said, be therefore perfect, even as your Father. Now, if I wanted to be perfect, even as Jehovah of the Old Testament, then I am following the ethics of that God, His law, and His commandments. But they don't want to follow the ethics of that God. They, they want to talk about how God had such ethics, but now Jesus uh, and His Father, and somehow they say these things and don't realize they're talking about two different gods. It's in our book, quoting people who are trying to refute me exposing themselves, trying to refute me. So they set their misinterpretation of Jesus' statements in the Sermon on the Mount next to the Old Testament Scriptures and accuse Jesus of teaching contrary to Moses' law. No, actually, they won't do that. They'll say, as, as a gentleman said to us just recently, I wouldn't say Jesus' teachings contradicted or corrected Moses' law, but just raised the bar, gave a, a higher ethic. Sounds so pious. Nathan was there and he spoke up and said, the problem is, and I'm just paraphrasing, the problem is 
that what God's law gave is a remedy for a sinful situation in Deuteronomy 24, Jesus, according to their teachings, called adultery. So, according to their interpretation of Jesus, the God of the Pentateuch led people into divorce and remarriage as a remedy for sin, a sin problem, and gave the death penalty for adulterers. Jesus, on the other hand, did away with the death penalty for adulterers while declaring that all divorced and remarried people were in perpetual adultery. Sorry, friends, that's not just raising the bar a little and, and uh, you know, bringing in a higher uh, glory or a higher view of the law. No, sorry, that's contradiction. Uh, when you say that, that a... A person who has jurisdiction over society, over his home, wherever they are, they're in a position where they have jurisdiction and they're not able to forcefully protect the innocent blood under their jurisdiction because that would be wicked. Talking about pacifism. Okay? They say that if you, if I as a father protected the innocent blood in my home against death or destruction if I did that somehow I'm disobeying Jesus I'm not living up to Jesus's ethics but Jehovah commanded such so it's not just it's not just a little tweak okay it's not just Jesus shining greater light on God's holiness and, and I don't know why they, they can teach this stuff and yet not figure it out he says here if we say, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, with who? Jehovah, the Logos, the Word that was with God and was God, the same that was in the beginning, the one that made all things. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Well, in Him is light and in Him is no darkness at all. That's my answer to Gnostics. In Him is no darkness at all. None of Moses' law was darkness. Okay? None of it. And to the same degree that you understand that and have right notions of God, to the same degree you have joy, John says. So if, if you say that you have fellowship with Jehovah, and yet you walk in darkness, you embrace uh, error. Now, understand that all of us probably have a degree of darkness through our ignorance. So this is not necessarily talking about uh, this is talking about you walking in the light you know. Walking in the light you have. That's the best you can do. You can't walk in the light to the degree that He is in the light. But you can walk in the light and pursue light with the same uh, mind that He has light. He loves light. You can love light. You can obey all the lights you have. You can, you can embrace light. You can uh, uh, um, investigate light. Okay? So you walk in the light, you walk in pure light as much as you can, and you can have fellowship with light. He is light. But you cannot embrace darkness and have fellowship with light. John says, these Gnostics claim to have be in fellowship with God. John says they're lying. They claim to know God. They claim to be God's people. They claim to love God and know God. God, John says they're lying. Well, how? what do you mean, John? I mean, they don't even know God, is what John's saying. Darkness is error, heresy, false doctrine, sin, unholiness, ungodliness. And you cannot walk in that and have communion with the God who is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. You cannot disconnect your position from your performance. Verse 7, But if, if, you know what if means in the Greek? It means if. According to Webster, it means in the event that, allowing that, on the assumption that, on condition that, that's what if means. So, if you plug it into the verse, you can say, in the event that we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You can say, allowing that we walk in the light, on the assumption that we walk in the light, 
on condition that we walk in the light. That's what if means. If, it's a choice. This is a conditional covenant. Okay? If we walk, what does walk mean? It means walk. It means how you live. It means how you operate. It means how you conduct yourself. If we walk in the light, Walking has to do with our doctrine. Light has to do with knowing God and, and having a clear conscience and right doctrine, the faith once delivered. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, let me ask you a question. Can you walk in the light and be lukewarm? Can you walk in the light and be worldly? Only if you are ignorant of the fact and think that you're really seeking God. But God says, no, that's that's uh, not what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. In that event, you would certainly quickly change because you are striving to walk in the light. I don't know how I evaluate on God's scale. I would hope that God would say I was hot. I can't guarantee. I don't know. I think I am. Okay? But, and I think God's Spirit would convict me if I wasn't. Uh, but he said to the to the Laodiceans, and no, it's not. Okay, there's people who run on some assumptions, but you cannot. You light demands walking and growth. Light defines. Light manifests. The more you want light, the more you'll get light. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it should be given him. When I'm out there hunting. And we go out there, sneak out there before it's daylight. We're sitting there hoping we don't freeze to death before we shoot a deer. Because after all, Junior wants to shoot one, and I'm his daddy, and so here I am, right? Uh, so we're sitting there. All of a sudden you look out. Is that a deer? I can't tell. Why? Because it's dark. But when light, when it's light, you can see everything clearly. Oh, that was a stump. That was a stump. I thought it was a deer all this time. Why? Because I couldn't see it clearly. Light manifests. You know, when you're doing drywall, I was up there doing drywall, I need better lighting. The scary part is, when you get better, better lighting, what's it going to look like? Light is data, it's facts, it's truth, it's doctrine. Light is understanding. God has all of that and we need it. But if we walk in that which we have, if we are in earnest about what we've been given, the fellowship is unbroken. <clears throat> Doctrinal inerrancy is not a re requirement for fellowship, but a pure heart, open heart, seeking heart, and a teachable heart is. Because you can have fellowship with God while you're growing. You can have fellowship with God while you're learning. It, hum it requires a humble acknowledgement. Walking in light means total honesty with God, with those around you. Total honesty. Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You can't hide anything from God. He is light. Now, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Can two walk together except they be agreed? You do not have fellowship or communion with God until you are reconciled to God. You've got to be reconciled from your way of thinking to His way of thinking. From your values to His values. From your pursuits to His pursuits. You've got to be reconciled. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the God that was from the beginning. Jesus was sent as an agent of reconciliation. So, Gnostics, how is it that the, the Son that was sent from the Father, Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, the Creator, sent His Son to reconcile the world to Himself. 
how is it that that son would come and teach anything contrary to God? That's not an agent of reconciliation. And it's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, pardoning them, forgiving them, washing them away, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I'm supposed to be reconciling your faith and your thoughts and your life to the God, the Creator God. Okay? Jesus was doing that. I'm supposed to do that. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. For he hath made him, Christ, to be a sin offering for us who knew no sin that we might be justified before God in him. I realize that I have changed the translation there, but it's more accurate. So, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, continually, in the Greek, the verb tense, continually cleanses us from all sin. This is the narrow way. This is the path to salvation. This destroys the Gnostic once saved, always saved. The reason they don't like 1 John is because they can't stand in 1 John. Their doctrine falls in 1 John. Justification is not a once-for-all transaction. It must be maintained by walking in the light and having fellowship with God. You cannot have the benefits of reconciliation with God and be in darkness. It destroys Marcionism. Jesus was the instrument of reconciliation between God, the God of the Old Testament, and man. Jesus was here for that purpose. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You cannot believe your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, or you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. Verse 8 is dealing with the need met by verse 7. If your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, why do you need to walk in the light as He is in the light so you can have fellowship and His blood cleansing your sin? You don't need that. And if you say that you have no, you say that you don't need it, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, that's, the if sets the time frame. If we today, if we now, if we presently confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The we includes the apostle. If we confess our sins, talking to Christians, confess, what does that mean? Obviously the whole purpose here is reconciliation. Right? So, confessing your sin is with the purpose of reconciliation. The purpose to restore fellowship. In Him is no darkness at all. We confess our sins for the purpose of getting out of darkness into light so that we can restore fellowship. In the context, what it's talking about. So confession is not just going to a priest and, and uh, whispering through the wall. It's a purpose to restore fellowship. God said if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has ought, in this case legitimate ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled with thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. God said if you want to reconcile with me, you make reconciliation everywhere else it's supposed to be. Everywhere else is appropriate. You get right. You get the darkness out. And then we can fellowship. It says He is faithful. What does that mean? It means He will always fulfill His role when we get in line with conditions He has set. I don't know if God will forgive me. He said He would. He said He would. He's faithful. And just. What does just mean? It means He's not partial. He doesn't play favorites. He doesn't change his conditions for different people. If one is fully repented and walking in the light apart from darkness, then everyone has to. If one has to, they all have to. God's not going to let you in under any special conditions. If you confess your sins, if you seek to restore fellowship, He is always glad to restore that fellowship, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's not just going to... Forgive your sins, wipe your record. He's going to renew in you, create in you a clean heart, a right spirit. Because 
Obviously, that's the purpose you confessed your sin, right? If that's not the purpose, then you really didn't confess your sin in this context. When you confess your sin, you're saying, Lord, I want to restore fellowship. God says, okay. You confess and forsake, I will cleanse and forgive. Not only does He wipe it off our record with the blood of Christ, the, the merits of the blood of Christ, the merits of that sacrifice, but he, will, he wants to bring us in and renew within us a right spirit, creating us a clean heart. He said, if you're going to walk with me, we got to agree. I'm in the light, and me is no darkness at all, God says. There's no darkness. And if you're going to walk with me, that's what you have to want. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, If we deny that what we did was a sin, if we deny that what we did was a sin, when God's law said it was, then we are trying to make God a liar. But we are the liar. If we say that we have not sinned, I have not sinned. If we say there's nothing wrong with it, I've lived a good life, I'm okay, I'm right with God, that's saying you've not sinned. But if that's contrary to God's word, then you're making him a liar. Either he's telling a lie or you're telling a lie. Who is it? So, very clearly, wiping out Gnostic ideas. When we speak contrary to God's word, which the Gnostics were, they were trying to make God a liar. That's where the devil started with Eve, isn't it? Hath God said... Oh, you should not surely die. Well, the Gnostics, they, they, they use that same tactic. The devil always uses that tactic. Basically, uh, let's not just obey God. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the reasonableness of this command. Let's discuss what God really meant. John says either God's lying or you're lying. <laughs> If you're walking in God is no darkness at all. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in Him is light and in Him is no darkness at all? Then every time He has spoken, every time He has commanded, you you should want to embrace it. You should want to follow it. You should want to learn from it. You should want to become like it. Uh, um, that song that we sing, um, "Let Me Be Like You." How's that go? <laughs> Oh, to be like thee. Yeah, I couldn't think of it. Oh, to be like thee. Why? Because you love light. And you love life. And you love truth. And He is the way. The truth. The life. He is light. And if you want darkness just a little bit, you can't walk with Him. You can't fellowship with Him. But if you want to be in the light as He is in the light, then you have fellowship. There's communion. If you say you have communion and still embrace darkness, John says you're a liar. So John said, by the Holy Ghost, they're lying. But, if you say, God, I want it all. I want pure light, no darkness. I want truth and no error. I want the faith once delivered and no additions or subtractions of the devil. And God says, we can walk together. We can fellowship together on that condition. And, and being that you are a fallen creature and you've got a marred record and you're likely to do it again and you make mistakes and you, you trip and you fall and you stub your toe, it, you know, God doesn't do that. But if you want to walk with Him, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. While you're striving to walk with God apart from all darkness, the blood of Jesus Christ will be there as your high priest when you mess up, when you have a bad day, when you have a moment of weakness, when you, when you uh, are overwhelmed, when you're broadsided and you react wrong. The blood of Christ will make it so you can restore fellowship as soon as possible and stay in fellowship. Let's stand together.
John has a lot more to say, but he's already destroyed once saved, always saved. He's already destroyed false grace. He's already destroyed the false love ideas. He's already destroyed Marcionism if people have enough sense to see it. Any thoughts before we pray? They mentioned about um, lukewarmness. Um, I think lukewarmness, well, you said something about walk, uh, how God reviewed me as wor wor wicked or worldly or lukewarm. I think lukewarmness is a condition of the heart and direction. You could embrace maybe some worldly ideologies without knowing it through ignorance. But I don't think you can be um, seeking after God and lukewarm um, through ignorance. I think I know he says, no, not that you're wretched, poor, blind, and naked. But that's because they were refusing to acknowledge that. But lukewarmness to me would, would speak of a condition of desire, a condition of, of heart, which God does require, and you, you seem like you'd be able to know that. I think, to a degree, that's true, but I think the Ephesians were surprised when he said you've left your first love. I don't think they realized it. And so, I think if the Lord showed up here and began to evaluate us, as a doctor would evaluate our physical health, uh, take our temperature and whatever else, check our pulse, if God showed up here and began to scrutinize and evaluate us, uh, we might be pleasantly surprised. I, you know, I know you're poverty stricken, but thou art rich. Like, oh wow, great. Or we might be unpleasantly surprised, and that's why we should walk humbly. That's why we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, because we cannot presume upon the fact that oh, I'm hot. God says, let's talk. <laughs> I think humility, uh, like that little saying said, humility is a strange thing. The moment you believe you have it, you've lost it. Um, and so, in humility, I think we ought to seek the Lord. Come before Him humbly. Come before Him uh, without assumption, without presumption. Come before Him saying, Lord, is it I? And let him, let him, uh, let him make those decisions and us just be open and humble and ready to receive. I think if you're open and humble and ready to receive, if you are on God's scale, on the lukewarm side, I think that he will bring you out of that. He will, he will bring people and books and circumstances across your path to let you realize, wow, I thought I was running fast, but look at that guy. I need to speed up. Um, God, God can do that, and I believe He will. Because He will speed you out of His mouth for something that you sincerely didn't know. Right. If there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. And if we're going to walk in the light, None of us can claim to walk in perfect light as he is in the light. But we can be willing for perfect light as he is in the light, and we can pursue it. And that's, that's where the communion comes in. God says, I'm going this way. You say, that's where I want to go too. <laughs> God says, well, come here. Something that kind of hit me interesting today is besides that point, uh, was Peter, Peter, James, and John seeing that transfiguration. Uh, and not being allowed to tell anybody um, until after the resurrection. So when Peter was telling the Lord, I I'm going to stick with you. I, if all men were saying, yeah, I'm going to stick all that heat in his back of his mind, I saw you talking to Elijah and Moses. Or Elijah or Elijah? Yeah. Like, I saw you. He, in his mind, there's a plan. And you were talking about something going on in Jerusalem. He must not have understood it, evidently. But no. he thought you this this has been something you discussed up there on the holy mount. 
dude, something's going to work out. And his mind had just <coughs> all went wrong, but he thought, I, I have a secret that these other people don't even understand, and I'm going to stick right with you. And everything started going different, and it, it, it shook him up. But it's interesting to kind of think of that as an aspect. And on me saying all that and living through that, he was probably falling back on the fact that there's a under, just like we kept hoping there was some underlying thing going to happen when all our country was hijacked. Um, and nothing happened. He knew something was, there was something underlying. The Lord had talk, was talking about this and he heard a voice out of heaven. There was just something going on here. He didn't understand it. But it's kind of interesting to that yeah, the, the the apostles are good examples of sincere hearts wanting to be hot, wanting to understand, and yet struggling with humanity, as we all have. And uh, you know, they they thought surely we're going to Jerusalem. Things, you know, the Lord's going to assert His power. Nothing can go wrong. And then, and then it seemed like everything went wrong. But uh, we know now, and Peter knew afterwards, that's why he said uh, what he said. But at the time, I doubt he understood what they were talking about. Later, he did understand. All right, let's pray.